Thanks for tuning in to Minds of Tomorrow. I'm your host, Luis Acevedo. And with me today, I have Matt from Crypto Heartbeat. Matt, thanks for joining us. Luis, awesome to see you, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. So let's uh, let's jump right into this. How did you even discover cryptocurrencies and get into the space? You know, going through your channel a little bit, I found out that you were around uh, for the dot-com boom as well. Yeah. So yeah. maybe some of that played a role in your discovery. Yeah, everything is FOMO for me until now. I, I literally came in, I got out of college in 96 and um, worked a little bit and dot-com era was booming, of course. First credit card transaction online was 1996 and people saying the internet was going to be this big thing. And I came uh, from Michigan to Dallas to a company that uh, was doing dot-com work. And of course I came at the the end of it all, right? So we were in business for about a year, but you know, March 2000 was tough for us. So I kind of missed that window. So I didn't have any, you know, I was just kind of a sales guy at that point. Um, and so I missed that and I was really interested in it. And so I ended up um, for the next 10 years building a business in internet fundraising. And that's kind of, you know, I sold that company and then you know, I saw crypto because I've got my two older brothers have been into tech for a long time. I got one brother at Microsoft, one that worked at Apple early on. And it was a, um, it just always around the house. I mean, computers everywhere. My brother was, you know, a bulletin board guy. I wasn't as into it. Um, but my brother got me into, um, we we're doing some mining early day mining stuff and we didn't have good enough hardware. And it was not a story to brag about. It was more of dabbling in, Hey, what's this crypto thing? And of course I've got the FOMO like everybody else has got about, Oh yeah. I remember thinking Bitcoin was too expensive at 400 bucks. And, you know, I look back on that. And so when I saw, <laughs> I tell the story on my channel a lot that when I saw, uh, I was up in the middle of the night. I sometimes have a hard time sleeping. It's 2 a.m. I've got cable, you know, TV on and some bizarre homemade internet ad comes on TV at like 2 a.m. And it's, would you like to be a billionaire? And I'm like, what is this? You know, and it felt so much like a network marketing deal. And I thought, you know, I wonder what this deal is. So I just searched it because I had nothing better to do on my phone. And I was like, this is really curious. And so that's really my first introduction to, to hacks was just curious what projects were out there. And I, I came across that one. Gotcha. So you guys were mining back in the early days of Bitcoin, it sounds yeah, like. I mean, I know you say, said it wasn't significant, but no, well, no. like 13, 14, 2013, 14, Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was 14 when we were doing our stuff, but it was on my brother had these setups with these USB drives that weren't producing anything. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, this was no, uh, you know, high end ant miner, you know, type of hardware or anything. So to say that we were in it is, I think, an overstatement, but I knew about it early on. And actually, a funny story. So my brother was really into it. Um, and he had a buddy who lost his Bitcoin and he had a ton of it. So he had mined early on and he came to my brother because my brother was really good at computers. And he said, all right, if you can find my Bitcoin on this computer that's crashed, I'll give you half of it. So my brother went through his machine, you know, and it was a, it had, you know, the computer had crashed and he found his Bitcoin. The guy gave him half of it and he traveled around the world. I mean, this is when that first, you know, the first high of, uh, of Bitcoin. So it just, yeah, it was around me, but I wasn't the leader of the family. My, my brothers were. So is that how you found out about crypto yeah. then through your brothers? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was really, those guys have always been on the, on the edge and I've been in the nonprofit space. And so everything I've done is, you know, nonprofit organizations are uh, late adopters. And my whole approach has been take the stuff that people are doing that are current and apply those things in the nonprofit space. And you look like a genius, right? You're, you're bringing this tech. They're like, oh my goodness, this is so cutting edge. And I'm like, no, not really. It is for you. Um, but I was just applying the things that were happening in the corporate space in the nonprofit space. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So you said that you discovered Hex through a commercial. Yes. I'd never heard that story. I've never, I, yeah. I've heard you say it on your channel before, yeah. but I've never seen a commercial myself of Hex, but then again, I don't have cable at my house. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I discovered it through uh, YouTube, actually, the algorithm. 
kept popping up Richard Hart's streams on my uh, feed. And when I saw how long the live streams were, I was like, I'm not going to sit and watch a five hour right. live stream of some dude, you know, like right. it just sounded insane to me, which I kicked myself in the butt for because, yeah. you know, it was, I mean, thank, you know, I got in at around five cents. So still very, very early on, but anyway, way different than you, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to, it's always been YouTube feed or Twitter or something yeah. like that, but a commercial that's interesting. Yeah, it was really bizarre. And this was prior to big payday. And so what was funny about it is they were using all this lingo. So I'm, I do a lot of messaging and marketing work and you can tell when something hasn't been crafted by, you know, experienced marketing people. And so it's, you know, it's disjointed message, but I could read between the lines and I'm, they're using all this internal, you know, crypto jargon. And one of the things they were talking about was big payday, which you would never use in an ad with someone who doesn't know what's going on. Um, and so I was really curious about that. And so I started watching Hexologist actually was really one of the first ones that I started watching and listening to what these guys were talking about. And this was, yeah, this was really pre, pre big payday. Um, I got in, I don't know, it might've been three or four weeks before big payday. So, um, and then of course I kicked myself for not buying that first dip. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you're, so you're an OG hexagon then. I, I, well, I don't, I don't hexagon. consider myself to be one because I didn't do all the things everyone else did. I didn't get involved in the community. Um, I don't know if it's OG or not. I, I consider the guys OGs, the ones that knew Richard in the early days prior to all this. So, sure. um, but you know, I'm not a big, I'm not one that's big on the whole uh, totem, if you will, on who's, who's been in it longer, partly because I want to make this community more accessible to folks my age, honestly. Right. And I feel like the, there's, I mean, it's just the nature of things. The people that have money, you know, generally aren't 22 years old. Um, and it's good to have them long term, but there's a lot of resources. And I feel like the message could be broadened to include people who are, you know, are real serious minded investors. And honestly, that's who I've been talking to. It's really, it's really been cool. Yeah. You know, I've been seeing that on your channel. You know, you've, uh, had one new hexagon come on and uh, I can't remember his name. It fleets me at the moment, but he seemed like real estate developer. Yeah. Mark and, Rostelli. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I think what you're doing is really, really important because what a lot of people are unaware of, at least to what I can see is there's a pension crisis taking place right now where people are concerned whether or not they will receive their retirement. You know, everybody talks about social security, but, nobody's really talking about the 401ks, your pension plans through corporations. And to me, that was one of the biggest things that drew me into Hex yep. was the idea of it being multiple things. Yes, it can be marketed as a CD on the blockchain. However, you can also market it as a, you know, your, your savings account, you yep. know, your child's tuition for college, your retirement plan, because you can stake so long out. And I know the conversation isn't going to be revolving around Hex so much, but that leads us into pulse chain yeah. because yeah. you, the only people who really know about pulse chain at the moment are probably people who are coming in from the hex community. So um, I'm assuming you then discovered pulse chain, listening to Richard Hart's streams yeah. as he was getting ready to release it. Yeah. So I think what really drove a lot of this is really the pain and what I love about Pulse Chain is it's really a new blockchain, right? Whereas there's 10,000 ERC20 coins and Hex is one of them. Now, is it better? Absolutely. Is it brilliant? Yes. But when you change the very nature of the infrastructure, which is this new chain, um, it, it had my attention because of the cost of the Ethereum gas fees. And so when Richard started talking about Pulse, I was paying attention. One, because I believe that um, he's smarter than most. Um, a lot of these meme coins and stuff, you see a lot of younger people kind of just throwing things against the wall. And I felt like he was giving it, um, an honest, um, you know, thoughtful consideration. Like oh, this is a smart guy trying to do something that's significant. And so, so the pulse chain itself, what really is the juice for me is the system state. Um, you know, I listened to Richard today on his, uh, Copenhagen live stream. And he basically said, you know, everyone else that's forked Ethereum has basically an empty fork. 
And the key to adoption is users. And so what, what an amazing way to basically steal market share by saying, hey, you've got a copy of your stuff here. And to me, that's this, you know, he calls it an experiment. And I think that's a perfect name for it. Um, I think there's so much opportunity, not just in HEX and PHEX, as they're calling it on, on Pulse, or the PLS token. It's really this infrastructure of what it enables when you have, I think, a mature, well thought out blockchain fork with all of this value on it um, that's cheaper and faster and better. And, and to me, I'm very interested in utility. So when I look at projects, um, you know, knowing that Pulse is the gas and that it is deflationary and that you know, 25% of these gas fees are going to get burned, it's got all the right pieces for me. Um, and I'm just excited to be in literally in the sacrifice set. And that to me, it's like I've never been there before. And so it's it's exciting. Yeah, you know, same for me. I've never been that early to anything. So I yeah. was... I, I just aped in on the first day. I didn't do any strategy. I was like, you Me know either. what? I don't know uh, if it's going to go up, down. I'm just yeah. going to put everything I'm doing on the first day, you know, make a couple small transactions to make sure they go through. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I, I you know, I, it was super exciting when that came out. In the system state, for those who are unaware of what that, it just basically it's copying every smart contract that's on Ethereum. So ERC20s, which are your coins like your altcoins typically and then your erc 721s which are your nfts um so it's it's taking over everything and i liked what you had to say in one of your videos that although it's going to help ethereum it could be the ethereum killer in that there will be no need for eth 2.0 yeah and, and you know that's part of i think wherein lies the issue is because you know I'm going to kind of give you a, a bit of a background story here. You know, when I came up in the dot-com era, everything was about users, right? And if you could get to a million users, that was like this threshold that you were successful in the dot-com world. Well, that's different in crypto. If you look at hacks right now and market cap and value and everything, there's what, 270,000 holders. It's not a big number in terms of like user counts for Twitter or something like that. And so the dynamics of who you've got to convince is less to have value, which to me makes it very exciting. However, um, it's not a very big tent right now. And I think that that's because of the marketing, right? It's attracted a certain group of people. And so to say that it kills Ethereum, I mean, I guess it's possible. I think though that Ethereum is so well-rooted. I just don't know if they can get their act together quick enough. But I think when they do, if they do, which I assume they will, or some really good layer two solution comes on to scale things, that um, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for Pulse Chain to attract some of those uh, folks who are building projects and are looking at different options and saying, all right, these gas fees, I just can't do what I could do on you know, a, a proof of stake type of uh, network that's you know, cheaper and faster. And so I'm hoping that Pulse Chain gets released quickly and gets really good uptake because of the community. And I hope, I mean, honestly, the reason I got into it, I'm, you know, to be completely honest, I'm trying to contribute to my own value. I want to help your value of what you stake. I want to bring more people in. I want it to broaden out and, and be more, um, just more mature. Right. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good goal. You know, and like one of the things that really excites me with Pulse Chain is the, fact that as you already said the whole system state's being brought over so more specifically nfts because yeah. i you know i i love nfts i've been collecting nfts since before the bull run of this year for nfts you know i've minted a few on ethereum and you know i, I didn't mind spending the money for gas to mint the few to try and you know just learn how how they work but that price puts a dent in your pocket very quickly on ethereum and so with these other blockchains that have come out like Solana and Tezos, I've sort of, you know, migrated to them to test them out because they're cheaper. The gas fees are practically free, essentially. And the only thing that they don't have going for them is I don't think big brands or big players are going to go over to them because why would they? I mean, you're, you're working with a behemoth Ethereum, right? But yep. now when you have Pulse Chain coming out, you're going to get people like myself who I've been doing a lot of NFTs on the Tezos blockchain because 
it's so cheap. Tezos is like what six dollars, yeah. you know, an XTZ right now. So it's like nothing. Um, and but with Pulse Chain, with the prices and the gas fees, going to be essentially free. I mean, you saw that with the test net. You know, it's like point yeah. zero 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 five of a a pulse or something like that. So it's it's insane. So and another thing that I want to get your opinion on is the market arbitrage that can develop between Pulse Chain and Ethereum because you're getting everything on Pulse. So, for instance, you could buy your crypto punk on Pulse Chain for, you know, I would assume so. You would be some front end that you could get your crypto punk from. And then you, you can create some market arbitrage, I would imagine. Do you have any take on that? Yeah, I think that that's part of this big question mark with the experiment is... You know, someone said in my uh, comments, they said, all right, if I copy the Mona Lisa and hang it in my house, is it the Mona Lisa? And I go, well, you know what? In a way, if you look at the DNA, it is the same Mona Lisa. It's uh, digital. It's the same owner. Um, but you're right. When you copy things over, um, is it the original? And what's the value of that original? And so I think it's really the opportunity is new, new um I don't know that NFTs are going to have, you know, par value on the pulse chain. I'm not an NFT expert by any stretch, but I do think that there's where I think there's the biggest opportunity, honestly, is if you think about the community, that's really where the value is. And if the community comes from Hex, then P Hex and E Hex, and I know that's not the final names of them, but just for conversation's sake, they're going to reach par value, I think, the fastest. Because people understand the product, that's how they got in. And I think we're going to see, you know, let's say we see, I'm just going to make up a number, 25 cent um, E hex and 25 cent P hex. Um, and I think that everybody doubles their bag and it's awesome, right? So anyone who's got serious hacks is going to have double. And I think that that's real. Um, but what I'm really curious about, and actually probably the topic of one of my next videos is, what are the top 25 ERC-20 coins where the communities don't know this is happening? And so let's just say you've got a ERC-20 that's selling or that's priced at $4 right now on Ethereum. And this copy hits. Well, it might be 0. 0.0000. We don't know what the price discovery is going to be, but there's going to be some huge bargains. And you literally might say, you know what? I'm going to buy $10 worth of these top 25 because they're all at the absolute bottom of the barrel. Now, you, you might only hit two or three that actually adopt something and it actually creates some value and discover some price. But I almost feel like that's the, the roulette of this process is you're going to be able to yeah take some flyers on this experiment and you might get lucky. Um, but I do think the core value is going to be P hex and pulse. Mm -hmm. Um, and I honestly, I don't know about NFTs. Uh, I don't know what a copy of those and what that would really look like. And because, you know, will you honor it? Well, it's the same thing, but right. and you're the same owner, I guess if it's, if it's has some sort of utility and you're going to trade it, you might trade it on it. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. That that's something I have thought about too. Like, is it really the same copy, but if you're just copying it, yeah, I don't know. Like it, it's just it's yeah. an interesting question. There's there's a lot of things that go into play here, and we're going to have to discover as we go. Um, but one of the things that also really excites me too is, you know, a lot of people talk about you know being a pioneer in an emerging industry, like that's the best thing to do. When actually it's not. Like if you look at the statistics, yeah. the best thing to do is be a second mover, and yeah. that's both what I think Hex and Pulse Chain are doing. They're they're second movers in their fields. I mean, obviously there are other blockchains that have tried to do what Ethereum's doing, but you know there there were tons of other you know Googles before Google became you know what I mean? Like yeah, totally. A bunch of other search engines. So that right there, like I think the statistic is like seven out of ten first movers get replaced by second movers, and so I I think that we're going to see a world where Hex and Pulse chain are going to be the top two cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's possible. You know, they say the 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 pioneers take the arrows, the settlers take the land. And you're absolutely right. The second mover. But also I want to I want to toss something out into this because this is what's been on my mind and heart for uh quite a while. Is I want people to understand that 
it's still very early in the the crypto space, right? And so I I liken it to the days when we used to type in IP addresses to get to websites. Mm -hmm. And of course now we we have naming conventions and there's domain names. It's we're still there, right? We've got these, you know, long strings of numbers and letters. It it looks like Greek and feels like Greek to a lot of people. Trust is not there, just like it was when, you know, should I put my credit card in on a website? So as far as it's very unknown and the process is still clunky and you know you're early when the masses of people have a hard time onboarding. And so it's even, I think for anyone who's, you know, relatively intelligent, but not very technically savvy would have a hard time onboarding themselves just by reading. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's going to have to change for it to go mainstream, but it's going to go mainstream. And so I think that I had always felt like I was late to the party because Bitcoin had gone up so much. And I, I agree with you. The second mover opportunity is really where it's at. And you have to be able to discern what is quality and what's not. And I think that that's what I've had to do and why, you know, when I invest in Hex, I'm not investing in Richard Hart, um, but I am. And I really feel like there's, um, there's a fundamental thing that, and really a point I want to make for your viewers is I want you to understand something very core. And that is um, political power and financial power has been bound together since the beginning of time. Okay. So if you win a war, you run the show. Okay. And this is a really, really big idea. And to me, it's the thing that separates out crypto from everything else is that, you know, people have conquered other people and, what do you get? You know, to the victor goes the spoils. You get the, you know, you get to plunder. And so you get to make the rules and you have the treasury. And this is such a coup. To me, it's almost a, a miracle that Satoshi writes this stuff and we let, you know, open Pandora's box and we've got this really cool thing. And what it is, is it's a separation of political power from financial power. And, you know, you think about, um, social engineering and, you know, every generation's got their ideas of how they're going to fix everything. And it's generally through the government because that's how it's connected, right? You can't get to the financial power centers unless you've got political power. Well, this changes it all. But what I love about it is that I would compare it to being like a, um, <laughs> you know, when you, when you have to poison a rat, you give them something that tastes good, but it ends up killing them. Well, the traditional, you know, the, the traditional financial markets are concerned about quick wins, right? It's all about what did you do for me lately? And it's, you know, super fast growth. I got to get returns, big gains. You see that with trading. And so this, this blockchain, and I won't even say Bitcoin because I don't think it's Bitcoin. It's this idea of blockchain is hung out there and they're seeing these gains. And it's so sweet. They're like, oh man, instead of getting my 20%, I could get... 3000 X. And right. so they're like, this is incredible. And so if you think about it, I, I believe fundamentally the human heart is corrupt and it wants it now. And so it's a trap in a great way for us as the individuals that are care about privacy, care about sovereignty, care about freedom. And so they see it as this opportunity. We got to get into this because it's going to go up and we're going to make all this money. But in reality, they're taking the poison pill and it's only in our favor. And I think what's so incredible about this is perhaps the future and perhaps there's some divine intervention in all this that literally says um, <sighs> there is a future in which if you participate in this system and that's a choice you make, and that's why I love Hex so much is it says anyone is at, um, everyone has an even footing. You don't have to be a Rockefeller. You don't have to know anybody. You just have to make a decision to be in. And regardless of who you are, what language you speak, where you live, you can get the yield that anyone else does. And so it's just a factor of how much you're willing to stake and put in. And what I love about that is it evens this playing field and it says, okay, you don't have to have political power because everyone who gets political power ends up corrupting the system and themselves. And 
I, I just want people to understand we've never seen disjointed financial power and political power before. This is a this is an absolute miracle. But here's the challenge. And for those of you that are into eschatology, you may find this interesting, which I know you are from your content, is, um, you know, uh, one of those things it says in scripture is that we're going to have to have a, a mark in order to buy and to sell. Well, in this separation of financial and political power, the people that have the political power are not going to be very happy. And there are going to be a lot of pain in that system when they realize that they're choking to death because they ate from this trough of value and they lost control. And so I think what's going to happen is you're going to see digital cash. You're going to see all of this stuff go to a cashless society and authoritarianism is going to increase. And what are we going to end up having? Well, in order for you to buy and sell, you need this. And now that's a whole other topic of discussion, but I foresee that it's so neat because it rings on both ends. One, it's freedom and sovereignty and literally potentially a way to solve major disparities when it comes to wealth. Um, but what I love about it is that it's not mandated by a government. It's a choice you make. And so to me, if abundance increases by people having opportunities to participate in a system, I think that that makes um, kind of this um, care for your local community. You know, people want to help each other. Problem is a lot of times they don't have the resources to do it. And you imagine what it looks like when you unlock those resources for people who actually care about each other. And to me, there's a potential renaissance in that. But I, I do think that the traditional powers are going to be, they're going to wake up at some point and go, oh, wow. Yeah, no, you, you touched on a lot of important things there that I have also, you know, thought a lot about. But I thought before I discovered Hex that it would be, you know, Bitcoin miners, Bitcoiners and Ethereum whales that are going to be the, you know, the people you're discussing, you're talking about right now that are going to disrupt this, you know, world, this, our culture, essentially everything around it. But it's going to be the second movers, I think. I mean, they, yeah. you know, the Bitcoin, Ethereum sort of paved the way. But to touch on something you said there regarding, you know, um, eschatology, the mark of the beast. Yeah. This is um, I- I'm glad I'm glad you said that, because this is an argument I've been making to people who think cryptocurrencies are the mark of the beast. I'm like, no, th- this is the way you circumvent what the state is yeah. proposing to you like it's decentralized you can just start you like with hex or with pulse chain i'm a, you know you can your own front end if, if you if you are computer savvy you know how to code you know how to build things on yep. the computer you have the ability to do it on your own like yeah you, you can avoid all the nonsense and that to me is super liberating and also why i think that uh, i'm also uh, you know i have a a theory, not really a theory, but my opinion is that America will balkanize eventually uh, sometime in my lifetime. I, you know, I would say maybe in a generation or so, just because of the political, you know, atmosphere, the social atmosphere, the economic atmosphere. It's all very turbulent right now. And you already hear states talking about secession in a, in a, I think in a more um, genuine way than they have before no for question. legitimate reasons. And then you have supply chain issues that are coming into play yep. that everybody's seeing. With that, I think that it's not going to be this big chaotic war you know, event that takes no. place that destroys America. I actually think that a lot of people that are in crypto, a lot of tech savvy people, a lot of other you know, more natural minded people who are doing homesteads, those kind of things, are going to eventually just branch off and start their own little communities and cities and towns and states because in America you have that ability to do so you know like something nobody really talks about is that you can go and like live in an unincorporated town in America and then yep. you can build your own little county government for yep. that unincorporated town and then eventually you know make it incorporated do whatever you want with it but there, there are so many tools you have. And I think crypto unleashes that for the people. So that way you can, as you said, like circumvent all this, oh, yeah. you know, the mark of the beast, whatever your fear is, as far as yeah. government tyranny, it's yeah. done away with. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's a really interesting topic. I've thought a lot about it as well. And of course, I'm in Texas, right? 
And yeah. Texas is, you know, hanging on by a very thin thread, one of the greatest cultures in America. And it's, you know, I'm a transplant, but people in Texas um, are independent in nature. And I think that you're right. I think there's this, uh, this separation that would be, um, it would be hard, I think, globally, but it would be helpful locally. Um, mm -hmm. And however that manifests itself, but yeah, it's, um, it's getting out of hand. And what I love about crypto is I, I want anyone who's concerned about kind of mark of the beast type of stuff is, I, you know, I don't know the answer, but I do know this, you know, um, <laughs> you know, when Jesus was asked, how are we going to pay our taxes? I mean, he picked up a fish and there were two coins in it, one for him and one for you. Right. Yep. And I think about that as a source of provision and a picture of the future is that money's a tool. And so many times we worship it. We know that it's a, you know, the root of all evil is, is the love of money, right? When we have it in its right place and we steward it well, it can be powerful for so many purposes. And so this idea of um, this big idea of freedom and autonomy and sovereignty increasing, it, what it really does is it forces you to think in terms of people and communities. And so I watch a lot of YouTube and I watched this girl named Lizzie Kui. You may have seen her out of China. She works with her grandmother. She makes food. She builds stuff. She's super resourceful. And it's probably a propaganda thing, but it shows the beauty of China, right? And so I look at her and I look at the, her grandmother and what she's doing. And it's the, the production quality is incredible. But I see into these places I couldn't have seen before. And I think the younger generation, they're just not as... Um, nationalistic and they're seeing the humanity because we have really, you know, it used to be what the newsreels we'd hear about, you know, the, right. what was happening overseas. And now it's like, you have access to build relationships and friendships. I mean, just like we're doing right now. And I think that that's where the humanity comes out and it's less about, um, about this issue of scarcity. And so, you know, it, I would hope that that would make this scarcity, um, violence, you know, that we fight over scarcity, almost non-existent. And I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is how do you use these building blocks? And the building block to me, and I don't think people relate to this, Hex is great, but Hex is one ERC-20 coin, and it's going to be copied over. What people don't realize is what Richard Hart built, in my opinion, and not the entire code base, because if you look in the code base of Hex, the front end of it is all marketing. That was with Big Payday. That was with minting your own Hex. That was with the Transform Lobby. He literally built Uniswap before Uniswap existed. He had to build it into his contract just to get ETH over to, to be able to mint uh, Hex. When you cut that piece out, what do you have? You got time deposit, you got staking, you've got penalties and you've got an inflationary system. Those core pieces, you're going to see over and over again. And I would say to anyone who's paying attention, when you see those building blocks of an inflationary currency that allows you to mint rewards based on staking, you need to get in on that project. And especially if it has no admin keys. And that component is going to be the future of, I think, liberating people from poverty, uh, mm -hmm. changing the world. And I think that, you know, you talk about first and second movers. He's the first one to basically create the certificate of deposit. Of course, staking is a big thing now, but there is beauty in that contract because of how it builds inflation and staking and penalties and rewards together. And to me, you know, there's a lot of banks you can get a CD in. This is the new building block for wealth creation in the world because it creates stability unlike all the other meme coins. And so that's actually what excites me more than anything is not what Hex or Pulse will do. It's what the next Hex will do. That, that I'd never even thought about that. As soon as you said Hex is a first mover and what it's doing, it just yeah. it was like, wow, you're right. So there's going to be something better eventually. You know, you're right. I mean, you're right. Hex is a second mover in the sense of Bitcoin and the blockchain. But because we're so early, it's showing us the way in which you can create a stable growing coin. But here's the thing that I think is people aren't really relating to is that you can't be all things to everyone, right? You can't be all things to all people. 
And we understand that there are uh, different people and personalities and views. And so I'll just kind of outline this. I believe that the tool of Hex, the fundamentals will exist in every major community, just like every bank has a CD product. Okay. So, you know, talk about minds of tomorrow. Here we go. I think that, you know, you look at things like um, the church, so religion in general, people that believe a certain way. Okay. Where's the coin for that? Where's the certificate of deposit for that? You know, if you think about Thrivent for Lutherans, right? Or the Southern Baptists have their own investment vehicles. You know, this is an opportunity to tokenize communities. And to me, you're going to associate with multiple communities. It might be um, your, your college alumni association. It may be, I think it's probably going to be a little bit more broad than that. It may be political movements. It may be uh, jurisdictions. It may be religious. And I think the people that are able to tie that value to utility, and honestly, I say this because this is what I'm working on in the nonprofit space, is I believe that there are people who care about different people groups. They care about different uh, sectors like um, health access. They care about opportunity and creating jobs. They, they care about poverty. They care about education. And I think that there are these communities and there are going to be in each one of those communities in the future, and this may be 10 years out, there are going to be these products that look just like hacks and they won't be called hacks. They'll be called something else, but they'll do the same thing and it'll create stability. It'll be the federal reserve and, and create gains and mint additional value. And I think it has this opportunity. If people are benevolent and caring, it's possible that it could lift communities out of conditions that they're in and I think it'll make uh, I think it'll make the governments really upset that a solution came from really out of the blue that surprised them. Um, and I think the real face of authoritarianism will show its head because um, you know people promise freedom, but that's not you know that's what they want. They want control. They do, and you know I, I like what you said at the end that authoritarianism will uh, show its head. When that comes, I would talk to uh, James Tunney. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. He's a barrister. He's now just pretty much does uh, paintings and uh, an author. And uh, he and I had a discussion. It's on my show. I think technologies and spirit. It's either technology and spirituality are the second episode I did with him that I haven't released yet. Either way, he said that um, Isaac Newton was the head of some mint, I, like in the UK. I don't. I, don't quote me on that. I'm paraphrasing. Sure. So he was the head of some silver mint for a country. And in order to deter people from using other currencies, his method was to punish by death. And so James Tunney, he was saying that he believes that the governments will go so far as threatening your life for using these other currencies, because as you're saying very explicitly here, it's a threat to governments. And yeah. One thing that I look at as the biggest threat, even bigger than cryptocurrencies themselves, are DAOs. I'm not yeah. sure if you're familiar yeah. with DAOs, but yeah. I think that they are going to be what, you know, in my opinion, maybe you have a different opinion on this. I think that they're going to be maybe a more benevolent form, or maybe they're all benevolent and they just become corrupt over time. And that is like the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the people yeah. who are like really picking who's in political positions to enforce things, right? Yep. Um, not not get into conspiracy theories, but it is no lie that people with a lot of wealth can choose or support who's going to be representing their state, their nation. They have a yep. larger sway than we do. And I you know think DAOs are going to replace them. I, I agree. And I think that, you know, when you have decentralization and you have, you know, Groupthink is a problem, right? People do get caught up in ideologies and such, but because there's not a political restriction, right? There's no limit. You could create one, I could create one. It's it's completely open. And I think that that nature of it means that consolidation will happen based on affinity. And so if you care about something, you're going to gravitate towards it and you're going to amass value, um, but you're going to make decisions for your people that believe the same way as you do. Um, but you know, what's interesting is, you know, when we talk about, you know, scripture and you think about the future is, you know, there's this, 
concept of a commercial or mystery Babylon, right? This idea that, you know, I look at Jesus walking into the temple and turning over the tables and the money changers. And you look at this when it comes to um, uh, Revelation 17, and you see this issue with, um, with uh, Babylon in an hour falling and people just gasping and going, wow, how could this great thing fall? And if you were to, you know, not that I know the future, but if you look at this from that perspective, you say, okay, um, things are changing. Um, there are tools. I think that there's this opportunity. I'm hopeful that, you know, I look at my parents who are hippies, right? And I, I joke with them. They're, they're super conservative now, but they were big time hippies back in the day. And I, I said to them, I said, you ruined everything. You ruined everything for us. And I, I am a part of Gen X who does not trust you, does not trust institutions, doesn't trust all this. And then the folks behind us are like, all right, we're the ones that are going to have to fix this. And the only thing I'm hopeful about is that as people that are kind of the baby boomer generation that really are the legacy controllers, and you have this more um, connected, community-driven group of people, and you see this with with interesting people like, um, I'm not a fan of his, but, um, Andrew Yang. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I look at people who, you know, he started some, he left the democratic party and started this new forward party. Yep. When you see people who are like, I'm here to fix things. Um, and I'm here to get work done. Um, and regardless of what you think politically about these folks, there's a different tenor to, um, the younger generation as far as, we understand that you broke it and we're going to have to fix it. And so we're going to have to do something differently to fix it. And so it's so incredible to me that we have cryptocurrency and we have this thing. It feels a lot like the early American experiment. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this idea, did you ever see the, um, the musical um, Hamilton? I have not. No. Okay. So yeah, obviously I'm very story familiar of, with his yeah, story. I've read a lot story of, of Alexander Hamilton, but there's a cool song in that musical it's called One Last Time. And, you know, George Washington basically says, we're going to teach them how to say goodbye. And, he, he, you know, Hamilton's really confused. He's like, what do you mean you're not running again for president? He goes, no, we have to teach them how to say goodbye. And this idea that we would let go of power and that we would create a system in which is decentralized. And what I'm fascinated with is back then, you know, there was this Christian nation, right? And these tenants, not that you have to be a Christian to believe them, but they're good for everyone when we say the man should be ruled from within, not from the state, which is outside of you, right? So you have this internal governor that basically is, all right, we shouldn't kill each other. We should be fair. We should do some of these basic things. It's almost as if cryptocurrency is the antidote to this this global corruption that is really about saying, I've got the power, I make the rules. And now it's saying, uh, -uh nope, the rules have been made and they're completely exposed. And this idea of being in the light, right. Exposed to, um, you know, total transparency means if you do try to corrupt the system, we're going to see it and know it. And it's almost like, just like America, like, really, did you really give away all that power? And to think that you know, um, Satoshi, really, did you realize what the implications of this were? You're separating financial power from political power, and that may change the very nature of the planet. And it's not what globalism is looking for. Globalism is trying to consolidate power. This is the opposite of globalism, but it has the impact of lifting, you know, everyone up. And I've never been this hopeful in the midst of such um, pain. And I'm just... Uh, I'm so interested in how we fit into it as a generation and how we shepherd it. Yeah, you know, you touched on a lot of important things there. And one thing in particular that I want to start off with is uh, globalism and uh, how cryptocurrency sort of combats that. And that's something else, you know, like you're one of the few people I hear talking about that. And because a lot of people who I associate with, they tend to be very, you know, skeptical of what the government's going to do. They're very skeptical of cryptocurrencies because of the yep. blockchain. And they're like, well, they can just track everything you do. And all these fears that I can't, you know, say aren't legitimate, but they, they can be sort of, you know, reduced 
with knowledge, I think, in education, understanding how these systems work. But this is why I think that um, in the future, you're going to see city states. Uh, I think yep. they're going to really come back in full force because, in my opinion, Nash nations are too big. I think they're too big for people to have a true sense of identity or they can get too big. You know, you have your smaller nations like Italy that's been around for years. China, China's a big nation, but that's an exception. You know, they 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 have a lot of like, well, it's uh, communist. I mean, they yeah, they, yeah, they iron fist, man. Exactly, and you know, they, <laughs> just a lot of torment in China. Like, it's insane. But but otherwise, it's a lot of smaller countries that have more so preserved their cultures for a long time. But I think once a nation gets too big, it naturally implodes. And then you have little tribes, if you will, that come together. And I think cryptocurrency, what, what I'm getting at with this is everybody complains about the tribalism that takes place in cryptocurrency. Yep. But in my opinion, there's a, you know, reality is sort of like, it, it's a dual, dual nature. So like there's a bad side to something, but there's also a good side to it. So what's the good side of tribalism? Well, if you have a family, you know damn well what the good side of tribalism is. That is, yep. you're going to provide for your family. And if, and if you have extra, you're, you can help other people. But if not, you're going to focus on your family. That You got you want to make sure that you eat. you got a roof over your head. And so you just expand that out to little cultures, little little communities. And cryptocurrencies is what you're saying. And, you know, a yep. lot of different ways can foster that and, and, and just freeze people a lot. And something else that you touched on was Andrew Yang with the forward party. And yeah. like you, I'm not a bit, the one thing I thought was really, really good on his part was the universal basic income. Mm -hmm. I, I that, that made sense to me because, well, we are already, we're just printing the money. Like the money's yeah. just being printed. So why not just distribute some of that money to other people? Like, you know, whether it works or not, it's it'll be an interesting experiment. Yeah, um, well, and, and I think that that's yeah. I think that's what you know. UBI and crypto. I'm not a fan of things that are um, er everything that comes from the government's got strings attached to it, right. and that's why crypto, when it doesn't have the strings, you, you make the choice. Now, if you want to not invest in your future, you don't want to be a part of this. But there's equal distribution in crypto based on your investment, and I like that because. It can't have strings. You know that? It technically cannot have strings if you're in the right project because there's no recourse for a smart contract because it has no power over you. And But that's that's my problem with UBI is that I, I'm a big fan of direct aid. I think direct aid cuts out the middleman, but I do think that there's serious issues when it's the government handing it out because it always okay. comes with, with strings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like... You, you, you mentioned where, where tribalism. I, I just want to comment about tribalism real quick. Go ahead. You know, if you look at Rwanda and, you know, people don't relate to, especially young people don't relate to the fact that millions of people were killed with machetes in 1996. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're from Belgium, you know a little bit more than most people know about it. Um, it's a very, very dark spot in, in history. You look at what's happening in China with genocide and, um, you know, the idea that we would pit one group of people against the other and that people would kill people from their own families in 1996. Right. And you think, is that even possible? I thought that's something that happened in the old days and it, and it isn't. And that's the bad part of tribalism that I think that we've gotten to the point where, um, you know, I've lost friendships over political beliefs and it's become so, it's been become so heated that it's literally separated good relationships. And I think one of the things that drives this and what I'm hopeful about is that, you know, when you have resources, right, you think about it, follow the money, right? Follow mm -hmm. the money. Well, wherever the money is, you have people gathered, right? And so I think what's really, I hope it happens in this is that when we think about communities, Community to me means unity, right? We, we have something in common and that common thing isn't hatred, right? So I would say, you know, if somebody got injured, um, you know, got in a car accident outside of your house, you'd run out to them and help them. You wouldn't ask what political party they were from because you care about humans, right? And I think that when we're not struggling for wrestling power, 
and money is a big, big part of that, is that we can associate and align ourselves with belief systems that are positive based on our worldview. And so if it's religious, you know, it's, if it's caring for people, if it's animals, if it's, you know, insert whatever thing you, whatever you care about and identify with, there's going to be resource there. And you'll be able to, and it may be big and it may be small, carve out a portion of value. So think about hexagons. Hexagons are a tribe. And you think about it, who are the people? Well, it's kind of an IQ test. You have to be of a certain, you have to kind of think through it. You're not chasing a dog coin. You're, you're having to think through, okay, I understand a CD. You got to understand banking. You got to understand some things. And then you got to look through Richard Hart and see past some of the craziness. And you finally go, aha, okay. So it's almost like you pass the IQ test, you're in this group. Well, that's a community. And I don't know what the sizes of communities are that make the most amount of sense. But I would say, to your point, there are points in which it gets too big and it breaks off. We see that with the church. We see that in a number mm -hmm. of different ways. But I'm just excited that a core amount of value, and I don't think people understand how much value is there, is if you look at the sacrifice into Pulse from the OA, what with 13 to 14 billion dollars yeah. worth of hacks, that is new created wealth. You know, you didn't, daddy didn't have to be a Rockefeller for you to have a piece of that action. And that to me is the leveling piece of all of this is what if everyone had more than they needed? How would they treat each other? I think it would change a lot. And I'm Pollyanna, naive, optimistic, but I, I hope to steer things in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I resonate with you there. I remember watching one of your, maybe it was your new, one of your newer videos where you talked about the four different personality types. Yeah, yeah. I thought you did a very well job, very good job articulating the personality types and how you should pitch hex to them and yeah. pulse to yeah. them. And uh, I, I, I'm kind of like you, I'm an idealist in a way, yeah. but I, yeah. I think I'm more, I'm, I'm a mixture, as you said, you know, it's not, not everybody's yeah. in one block. I'm more of a right, ra right in between rationalists and idealists. I try, you know, but yeah. I'm a daydreamer. So a lot of, you know, yeah. I think big and all these things, but, you know, I, I thought that was really, really spot on when you did that articulation of uh, the four different personality types. Um, something else that I wanted to touch on here, since we're getting a little spiritual with our discussion is uh, yeah. I want to hear your opinion on this yep. is blockchain itself. I I've always made the analogy that blockchain, not always, but, uh, but this year I've had this realization that uh, with it, for those who are still unaware of what block, you know, it's just basically a decentralized, le well, it's not, yeah, decentralized ledger. So it's just a list of your receipts pretty much, right, on your computer. Yep. And all your transactions. And so it clicks for me that this is like spiritual because if you look at like the book of life, you know, all your works or all, everything you've done is going to be recorded and God will know. Yep. And, you, and this goes across not just Christianity, you can go to the Hindu religion, where it's the Ashkenazi yeah. records, where sure. everything you've done, everything you think, everything you say is recorded. And so blockchain in this way is mirroring the spiritual world. And this is why I think it is so liberating, because it's like this, you said it, it's, it's this renaissance that's taking place. And with the last yeah. renaissance, what, what caused the renaissance? This evolution in thinking of religion and spirituality yeah. and the true nature of humanity and i think blockchain is unleashing uh, uh you know showing us um a, a deeper you know sense of humanity in it i, I would like yeah. to hear your thoughts on that yeah you know it's interesting i appreciate you opening this this uh this topic it's something that's important to me and i'm not a you know i'm not prophetic in in any sense or or way i i just look at things and i say all right if you do subscribe to creation and you kind of have to be there that you look at things and you say, Hey, there's kind of a framework to this. It's set up a certain way. And, you know, I had a buddy who told me, he says, why do we have opposable thumbs? You know, it's because we're supposed to do work. And if you think about this, that we were created um, in an image to create ourselves. And so what do we do when we create, we create things in the same framework as the system that we live in. 
right? So some people call it this quantum system. Fine, you label it everything you want. But at the end of the day, there's infinite resolution. So if I look into the cell, what do I see? I see the, the code for you, right? If I look at a leaf and I hold it up, it looks like a tree. If I understand mental brought fractals and I realize that all of this stuff is infinite resolution, I look at the solar system, it looks like an atom. I see a spinning you know, galaxy and the universe and all this stuff. And I say, all right, there's order to this. And there's some, there's a framework. And so I think that what we typically find is that, you know, if we were to create, and I look at Elon Musk and, you know, are we in a simulation? And I would say from a spiritual perspective, um, yes, it's been created and spoken and we live inside of this thing in which God is outside of it. Um, but what's really interesting is what are we creating? Whether we change our address and move to Mars doesn't change a damn thing. Because at the end of the day, we're creating, I mean, think about this. Um, uh, you know, God says, I am, right? That's one, not zero. That's one, I am. Okay, so what is the function around things? Well, even in the quantum space, we look at things and it, it doesn't decide what it is until it's observed. We have to see it in order for it to basically develop its state. Well, if you're a, a gamer and you understand Unreal Engine and how they render polygons, you know that in the surface, if my character's not going in this angle, I don't need to render the stuff behind because it's out of view. But if I drill down into this tree, I've got to see almost infinite resolution. It renders on the fly. But I don't need to render the, all the trees in the forest, only the one that you're looking at. And so when I think of how we're creating we're creating just in the same way. So the blockchain to me is an extension of, I think, some of the goodness around transparency. You know, when, it, when people often talk about, it, I think my mom said this, you know, nothing good happens after 2 a.m. or after midnight. And you think about darkness, right? This idea of you can get away with stuff when people can't see it. And I think that that concept in that construct of every day and every night the sun comes up and it exposes things is the same framework that we have and that's why i think that the blockchain is a gift not from the demonic realm but literally a gift in the sense that it's a tool and that tool i'm really thankful um creates a new paradigm of separating political power from financial power which gives regular people an opportunity to participate on an even footing um, and so, you know, I could over spiritualize it, but what I love about it is it's almost impossible for us to create anything of value that's not inside the framework of creation. Right. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I, I am one that subscribes to the creation theory. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't really call myself a Christian, although I find myself these days slowly finding my way back. There's just every time I you know, not, not to go too far off topic here, but every time I tend to deviate in some way from that belief system, there's something I learn along the way that just sort of pulls me back in. So yeah. it's just this, it's like a, it's like the gravitational pull is just too strong for me to, it is. And it. I, can't, I can't hit escape velocity. You <laughs> know, what's so funny on. about it. You know, what's so neat about that is I, I was, um, I was, a, I'm a, I'm a Paul character. All my life until I was 28 years old, I basically killed Christians, you know, and I mean that figuratively. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was, I was very anti Christianity and it wasn't until I had a pretty dramatic experience that, um, was just what I needed at the time. You look at CS Lewis, he goes, they asked him when he knew he was a Christian. He says, you know, I took a ride on my motorbike and when I arrived, I knew I was a Christian and it's funny how he, he, he says it. But if you look at the road to Damascus, you know, not everybody has to have be blinded for days and have a great light and a voice, you know, but I will say when I read the book of John and, you know, I, I I'll kind of expand on this a little bit is what I love about personality types and the fact that, you know, normal people are looking at people and saying, you know, there's kind of four different types of people. Well, I look at the gospels and I just love it because Matthew starts out with a genealogy. All these people that are concerned, all right, is this really connected to the right guy? And it's to the Jews are like, okay, this one's for those people that are looking back that are concerned about guarding it based on, you know, historic preservation. And then you've got Mark, which is like, this is super fast and quick. And that's the artisan group. And then what cracks me up is you look at the introduction to Luke and it's like, 
I'm going to actually write the correct one. This is a um, a commissioned work that says, all right, all these other bozos don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to give you the correct. And he's a doctor, right? Luke's a doctor. He's like, I'm going to give you the rational, real story. And then John is like poetry. And so when I engaged with the book of John, I literally became technicolor to me. And I, I basically had to face it and go, I'm either going to believe that this is true um, or I'm not, but I got to make, I got to do something with it. And here's the thing, a tree is known by its fruit, right? The fruit in my life and my family and everything. Um, I, I met a doctor one time in a doctor's office and he said to me, he goes, what if we're wrong? And I was like, whoa, that's a big question. What if we're wrong? What if we're not right? What if Christian, we're not right? He goes, think about the implications People are healthier, they're better, they're more fair. People might not like your politics or like your religion, but they sure do like it when you treat them fairly, treat them kindly, serve them, you sacrifice yourself for them. And I think about that and I go, okay, if we're wrong, at least we're going to have ourselves a better life through it. Um, I believe we're right, but um, it's not about right and wrong. It's more about um, you know this, this impression that you have that I see the fruit from it. I see the fruit all over the place and I feel like there's, um, there's power there. And I think that's why it's kind of like a gravity well to a lot of people is like, you can run, but you can't hide. And, you know, and, and I also take it, it's not my job. I'm not, I'm not God. Right. And in, in, I don't know if you saw that Count of Monte Cristo. I love the 1996 version of the Count of Monte Cristo with Jim Caviezel. Um, the priest says to Edmond Dantes, he says, uh, he says, um, Edmund Dantes says, I don't believe in God. And the priest says, it's okay. He believes in you. And I was thinking about that. I was like, well, it doesn't really matter, right? He believes in you, period. And I, I just, I think that's just cool. Yeah, no, it is. And, you know, like, uh, I guess just to keep going on this, the thing that has really been getting me late lately is, uh, so I used to do Bible studies all the time. I have an uncle who's a pastor. And oh, cool. uh, I, when I first dove, deep into Christianity. I'm the type of person that once I like something, I just get obsessed over it and I go deep. And uh, so my wife and I, right away, we joined a Baptist church. I was like, I don't know anything about the denominations. Like I grew up, I would say half-ass Christian because yep, my parents, all, all they too. would do is say, Hey, pray, you know, pray before you go to sleep and we'll pray before yeah. dinner. And yep. We're good. Never talked about the Bible, none of this, but always talks about, you know, there's a God yeah, etc. Right. Yep. So coming into Christianity, I'm like totally ignorant, and so I'm like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna join this Baptist church. You know, the pastor sounds kind of based, right? I was like, yeah, cool. like I like it. You know, it's going against yeah. a lot of like the transgender movement, all this stuff yeah. that I don't personally agree with. You know, like, but I'm very open minded. You know, yeah, that, that's the thing. I think people get misconstrued yeah. with Christians. They think that. Yeah just because you don't agree with their lifestyle that you hate them. It's like, I don't hate anybody. It's like, no. I mean, no. do you, I just don't think it's the right way. But anyway, um, so I joined that, we joined the church. And uh, as I got deeper into the theology, it was just like, this makes, to me, I was like, this makes no sense. I found so many inconsistencies with their theology. And then I started searching, like, I'm also, I love history. So Yep. I then ended up uh, going all the way back to the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and uh, got every book I can that, that I could absorb at the time, and you know, it, it, as well as the Bible. You know, so I have a but I'm, I'm the kind of guy that you're going to come into my house and you're going to see like six different Bibles. Like yeah. that, that, that's sure. how geeky I was when it comes to, you know, this work. So um, anyway, so I went through all this journey and uh, ended up almost staying at the Orthodox church just because of the mysticism, the symbolism, it made yep. very, it was very logical to me and as is Catholicism in my opinion. But anyway, there, there was just something that took place over this whole, we'll just call it the bird flu, right? Yep. That just made me lose a lot of respect for pretty much. I, I kind of threw everything out with Christianity. I'm like, you guys aren't standing up to anything. Right. Like at least no, nowhere near me in Ohio, that was like yeah. anything yep. Yep. They, they were going with it. And it, it was to me, it was like, isn't this what we're told to not go with? Like come to the Bible belt, man. Right. We, we, we resist down here in Texas. <laughs> I know. I know. You know, my wife and I, we looked at Tennessee for a while, Orthodox churches down there. And uh, 
none of them were following anything. I was like, wow, yeah. that that's what's up. But um, anyway, what, what I'm getting at with all of this is the thing that keeps drawing me back is that I, the postmodernist way of thinking, I just can't actually see how it works in the world. Like I get some of it, like our feelings can be subjective. You know, there's certain things that can be subjective and relative, of course. However, there, there are truths in this world. Like the, right. the most obvious ones that I, that I see, that everybody sees, it stares them right in the face. And it's kind of ironic, the sun. The sun right. comes up every morning and it sets every evening. Then the mm -hmm. moon comes up in the evening and then there's four seasons. Like there is absolute truth to this reality, whether you like it or not. And so then if you just keep following down that line of thinking, well, then there has to be an absolute, that there would have to be a maker, wouldn't there? Like yeah. this absolute truth. So, you know, th that's the thing that keeps getting me. Like maybe I'm trying to be too like uh, litigious here and trying to find yeah. legal stuff. You know what though is so cool about it is, you know, I, I, I look at it, you know, I think that, you know, there's been a whole movement in the evangelical church about being attractional. They want to do everything they can, you know, some, you know, young hip pastors coloring his hair and well and wearing all these fancy clothes to try to be attractional to people who are unchurched. And I think about it is, you know, when you look at the person of Jesus in the scriptures and you look at what the fundamental thing that was accomplished in all of that, um, you don't hear the same dogma in when you, when you encounter that truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I always encourage people, I say, all right, there are conditions of the human heart. There's a, you know, um, we're all searching for something. I think I saw Tom Brady talk about having five rings wasn't enough before he got the next couple. And, uh, Jack Welch, uh, CEO of, uh, I think it was GE, um, really struggling. It's like, I've got all these things in the world, but I still have this hole in my heart. I don't have peace. And so one of the things that I say is God's currency in this world is peace in your heart and in your mind. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if you've got angst, and I, I see this a lot of times, people chasing things and they're like, literally, I'm going to, I, I have to have something to fill this gap and nothing fills that gap. And that's really, I think how God gets our attention. But, um, when you think about this idea that we're all unclean, right? And you think about this idea of, well, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm a good person. And I, you know, I think if you don't understand the fundamental nature of corruption of the human heart, it's really hard to come to it. And I think the modern church has gotten away from this idea that you're sick. You know, if you look back at the great awakenings in the United States, there were two of them late 1790s. And then the 1840s and 50s, where the birth of like 93 different institutions um, were birthed on the East Coast for the training of new pastors, which is funny, like Harvard and Dartmouth and Yale and all these schools were there actually because of the Great Awakening. And, you know, you think about people like George Whitfield who traveled across the ocean to preach. Um, what's neat about church history in that respect is that... Um, Ben Franklin built the first building at the University of Pennsylvania for George Whitfield to preach in, and he was not a Christian. And what's really fascinating about that is that, um, you know, there's this um, there's this encountering of the supernatural that happens, uh, I think, quietly in the human heart, and it's almost like this: I'm trying to find the truth. I'm trying to find this stuff, and. Um, that's where the story is like in the book of John. And that's why I always encourage people to look at it is to say, just read these and take a look at it and see, you know, how do you, how do you deal with this? And because I don't read in there, um, Jesus ever saying, you need to accept me as your personal savior, right? Mm -hmm. That's a construct of, of the church. Yeah. And this idea of, you know, what did he say? He said, follow me, do what I say. Even the rich young ruler, he's like, I've done everything the way you said. And he's like, well, go sell everything and follow me. And he's like, oh, I can't do that. And you think about this idea of what does it really mean when this thing isn't built around you? This thing, it's not made for you. And I think that the greatest leaders and the greatest people that we follow and are attracted to are people who they care more about us than they care about themselves. They are people who, um, 
you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care for them. And so I find that the fruit of the spirit ends up being patience, kindness, long suffering, you know, all the things that everybody loves. Right? I mean, I'd love for someone to care about me and to serve me and to help me. And that's who I see in the person of Jesus. And you go, you know, it's, uh, you know, if the tree doesn't have fruit, don't, don't be picking it. Yeah. And, you know, you, you touched on something important there that I think also a lot of people don't understand when it comes to Christianity is that this was one of my critiques of Christianity, more specifically Jesus, is that this is just because I'm looking at it from my perspective is what I would do. And not everybody is built uh, the same way as Jesus in this sense. I know, obviously, some people are going to be like, nobody's built like Jesus, but I'm talking right. in a specific sense. And that is martyr, to be a martyr. You know, I, I tend to think that Christianity promotes uh, like three different classes of people, if you will. That, that sounds kind of crude to say, but I think, I think you'll appreciate yeah. uh, the, the, uh, the three classes here. So I would say the villagers, you know, your commoners, your people who kind of make the city do its thing, right? Make, make yeah. the community do its thing. You know, they're you know, farming, they're fixing up things, they're artisans. And then you have your warriors that are protecting the city, like yep. keeping the villagers safe, making sure the village is working just as it should. And then you have, and this isn't in a particular order either, like the warriors can probably yep. be lower than the villagers. But the highest order of man, I would say, is martyrdom, to be able to sacrifice yourself for the greater good. And that's something that I feel gets left out a lot when we talk about Christianity and so what I was getting at with this is that I've always struggled with how Jesus handled his death because I'm the type of person who would be like, I'm going out swinging. Like, you're not taking me. Like, yeah. like that's me. Like, that, that's the way I envision a man would protect yeah. his people. Like, you yeah. go out fighting, man. You, you fight with your soldiers. Like, Peter was swinging a sword for you, man. Yes. You should have yeah. jumped in there with him. But instead he was like, no, yep. don't. This, yep. this is what. And so, like, that, that's always been a little... Uh, struggle for me just because I'm a different personality type, if you will, than maybe that is, or maybe there's something that I'm missing. But what yeah. I what I was getting at too, also with this, that um, there's this. I think in Christianity it explains it very well. So, like in the Old Testament, it's more so external, like let's build the church, let's build the nations, let's etc. Right, and that involved a lot of things that people will demonize Christianity for. But, yeah. you know, it is what it is. And uh, but with the New Testament, it's more internal. It's showing you how to become a better person yourself. So in Christianity, it's actually showing you the as above, so below, as you will, which so many people yeah. think is Freemasonry and stuff. But sure. that's what you're touching on. It's like, yeah. you know, like not only did Jesus, you know, sacrifice himself for the people and submit, but he also had enough. I would even call it ego to be able to stand up for himself and stand up for what he believed in, because something nobody really talks about either is Jesus was kicked out of his own church. And like, uh, I think it was like in Luke or something where he started, he was like, this is me. He was reading from the Bible and he was yeah, like, God, yeah. Isaiah 61. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, yeah. and everybody was like, get out of here. You blast. He dropped the mic, man. He dropped the mic. He did. He said, this, <laughs> this has been, but to tie this all back into what we're talking about here, and by no means am I comparing Richard Hart to anybody in this in this particular case, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to bring this up from his uh, live stream he did today from Copenhagen. Yeah. I didn't watch I, all of them, but I watched some actually, um, and that was when he was talking about um, wealth is not actually what's in your bank account, but what's in your mind. Yep. And I think this had just like you said with God, God's currency is peace in the heart. You yep. know, so like, and that's the whole thing here. Like, am I? Am I very excited about the potential of Hex and Pulse and what they can do for my bank account? Of course. That's why most people are investing in it. However, I can tell you confidently that although I'm not a millionaire, I do picture myself as a what I, I just embody that. Like that, that's just, you know, and I think that uh, I think it's important to do before you even actually acquire that wealth because you're training yourself. It's, I don't know if that makes sense or not. It but. totally does. It totally is. Well, if you've ever read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki's yep. book, you know, I, I was raised by a poor dad and not that he's a bad guy, but that he, he raised me 
it, that basically you're supposed to get a job and take your time, if you will, right? Right. He he wasn't one of of building things of value. Um, he was not an owner. And I think about the difference between, you know, being raised by a poor dad, meaning, you know, go to work and work in the system. And then the rich kid, right? The rich dad, what does he say? Own it, right? You own, you, you have ownership in things. <clears throat> and so I think that, you know, what you're getting at with this idea of um, wealth is in the mind is one of these things about personal responsibility and how you see yourself um, as a player in this, right? And so, <clears throat> you know, self-help has been, you know, created really since the early days of Napoleon Hill, you know, Think and Grow Rich, which to me is one of the greatest books ever written because it predates all of this craziness and self-help. But he he outlines Dale or uh, Andrew Carnegie's um, uh, you know history and story of philanthropy. But what people don't realize prior to that story is um, Carnegie had built with his rich friends a um, uh, like a country club on top of a mountain, right? And they told him that the the um, levy was going to break and they need to fix it. And they didn't. And I almost feel like, it, you know, them partying up there, um, all these industrialists, you know, the fat cats and the levy broke and killed 15,000 people downstream. It was one of the biggest man-made disasters in U.S. history. If you look at that, I mean, you can search it. It's um, like nobody knows about it, but he was so distraught because he had built so much that if you look at all of these Carnegie libraries and all these small towns across America, he was trying to redeem his wrongdoing, right? He was trying to redeem this thing. And I think about what is this idea of, you know, being wealthy mean? I think it's, what is the story you're telling yourself? Are you a victim of circumstances? Are you somebody that, you know, the, the law's out to get me, the police are out to get me, or whatever it may be, and that you're a victim? Or are you someone who is an owner? And I think that um, certainly peace is the core currency. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about this. We had financial trouble, severe financial trouble. And I had a friend who introduced me to a guy. He goes, hey, I got a buddy who wants to talk to you. And I was like, what? I don't know this guy. He gets on the phone. He says, how you doing? I told him what was going on. He asked me this question. He said, how are your kids doing? I said, fine. He goes, how's your marriage? I said, yeah, it's going all right. He goes, financial troubles are the best troubles to have. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, how are your kids? You know, and I think about this and I go, if you've ever lost a child, you want to know pain, right? I would not trade any financial ruin or wreckage for that. And so when you think about really what matters in life, um, you know, you start evaluating it differently when you think that well, if I only had the next Super Bowl ring and if I only had this and that, and I think that when you mature and get to a point, and I think also this is what, what having the currency of God of peace in your life, you say, okay, it's better to give than it is to receive. Mm -hmm. It is. It, it's just fundamentally better. And when you start changing your paradigm to saying, I'm here to serve other people and help them win, that means... And that's what I think Richard Hart's doing in this really strange sort of way. He understands fundamentally, he wrote these self-help books. He understands fundamentally that if I can help you win, you give me what I want. And he wants respect. He doesn't want money. He's got money. He can't buy respect. And so he's going to try to help as many people as he can win. And that's why I think he's been so effective and, you know, he's built the engine for it. So, yeah, yeah, that's cool, that, uh, man. It is, you know, like uh, Gary V says something along the same yeah. lines that instead yeah. of tearing down all the other buildings, just make the biggest building yeah. and you know, people will come and, you know, I, I love that. And another thing that I would like to add to, you know, this, you know, thinking, you know, like I said, like trying to, you know, embody this sense of being wealthy and, uh, you yeah. know, and also the peace of God, you know, what, you know, yeah. acceptance is also uh, more so on the financial side, something I do. Uh, I try to also do in a thought experiment, like, what would I do if I wake up tomorrow and I look at my staker app and it's zero? You know, I think about that. I'm like, will I just sit there and be like, well, there goes my opportunity at, at, at riches? No, like what I think about is, okay, there's a million other ways that I can get to yeah. where I want to get to. Like, 
I can just work a lot harder. Like, to be quite honest, I'm not working as hard as I used to, like as, yeah. as far as like just with jobs and stuff, uh, because I, I feel a sense of financial security to the point where I'm like, I can sort of, which maybe I shouldn't, I'm only 25. So maybe I should just be like full throttle, but I'm also really enjoying my time with my family more. You know, I feel yeah. very comfortable in the position we're in financially, but I, I like to think about that too. And I would encourage other people to think that too. Like what if the worst case scenario happened to you? W- would you be a victim to it or would you just keep going? And like, yeah. for me, I know that I would keep, cause there's so many ways like, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, you think about it too, is that I, I saw years ago, someone talk about wealth um, and there's this line that crosses. It's like, it's a line of diminishing returns, mm-hmm. right? So the, the line is parabolic when you're poor, right? And so, you know, you get an extra 300 bucks a month and you're poor, you can change your car, you can change your housing. It can really change the very nature of your lifestyle, where you sleep, what neighborhood you live in. And you start pushing that stuff up there further and further and further. And you say, okay, at what point in time? And it's not that it's too much. It's that it, it, it isn't proportional in its growth to peace and joy and value, right? It, so I knew a guy who sold his business for $7.8 billion. It's now called CVS Pharmacy. And he bought his company or he sold his company and literally walked away with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And... I would see him, he was an investor in my company, and I would see him have to sign every week about 800 checks. You know, he did it, he did it by hand and all the contingencies he had five to eight homes across the world, all of these things. Now this was, you know, he, he made these choices, but you don't know who your friends are. You, everything is about one upsmanship of everyone else. And, you know, you look at people who we admire in life. And they're just not people who flaunt their wealth. They're the people who invest in us and believe in us and encourage us and help us. And that's the kind of person I want to be. And so the tool of money, there is a point where it's extremely helpful, right? It gives you security and all that sort of thing. And obviously pushing it out to help future generations. But what we've seen throughout history is that really, really wealthy people that give their money to their children destroy them. And that's why people will say, I don't give any money to my kids. I give it to my grandkids, but I put it away in a way that basically takes care of the basics because one of the worst things you can do is give a kid a trust fund. And so these people like you and me who, you know, Midwestern sensible, right? We literally work hard and we build something and we make life better for everyone. And we come out of, you know, for me, it was very, very low income family to building businesses and, and doing well financially. And the problem is my kids, you know, have wanted for nothing. I mean, I had to work to pay for school and I had to do all these things. And it, in a way it shapes who we are. And, you know, that's why I look at money and I say, we've got to realize it's a tool. It can be used, but there's a point in which um, I think you have to ask yourself, How am I going from this success that I'm having that's accumulating stuff to significance? And so I'm going to be turning 50 this next year. And, you know, they call it a second half. And there's a book by Bob Buford called Halftime. And it's about going from success to significance. And there are people who have destroyed their families, working, working, working to, you know, generate all this wealth. And then they're looking around going, the kids are out of the house. And they're like, what do I do? And what I love about crypto and kind of to wrap all this stuff up with a bow is the fact that a guy like you, who's 25 years old, you're a part of a next generation of people who literally are going to see value in a different way. And I think that you're going to have an abundance um, and the right perspective. And I think that that's going to impact the people around you because it's going to unlock generosity in a new way. And we're seeing that with what's called the impact investment movement. People that have the big wealth are saying, hold on a second. You know, in the past, we would just destroy communities of indigenous people to take the resources out of a country, you know, colonialism and all that stuff. And now we're rethinking that saying, hang on a second. Can we maybe make a little less money and still actually help the local people or whatever it may be? That's overly simplified. 
but this idea that I can make a profit and I can improve the lives of people. And that's very, very attractive. And so many things are moving in that direction. That's why I've got hope for the future. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. I'm very optimistic as to what the future holds. I know yeah. we're in trying times right now, but there, there are a lot of silver linings. You know, there, there are a lot of things to be very, you know, encouraged by. So yeah. Matt, I thank you again for coming yeah. on the show, man. It's been very, very fun talking to you. Get yeah. a, you know, get, get to know a totally different side of you, which was totally unexpected. Yeah. So I really do appreciate yeah. the transparency. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Well, it's cool. And that's why I do interviews. And I think you're in a really cool position because the more and more you can do this, um, yeah, you, you end up developing relationships with people and you just never know how those things will come back around. And I just think it's, uh, I think this medium of YouTube and, and channels and all that stuff is, is a big part of building trust, you know, across boundaries. So thanks for your time, man. Yeah, of course. So where, where can people find you, Matt? Okay. So I'm on YouTube. I'm uh crypto heartbeat on YouTube. Um, and my Twitter is crypto heartbeat, but the heart is spelled H A R T because someone else took the right spelling. But yeah, if you look for crypto heartbeat on YouTube, you'll find me and you'll see any way to contact in the description and the about page. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to help, you know, I, I said in a video, I'm just trying to, I'm a beggar helping another beggar find food. And, you know, I've found some, right. I found something that could feed us. And it's like, I just want to tell as many people as I can about it. Um, because you know, it's, it's a miracle. Yeah, it, it really is. So once again, Matt. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, sir. See ya.